projection TV. Right, afterwards, we have the flat panel, right, which include, for example, uh, plasma, LCD, LED, and so on. Right, most of the current technology is based on this uh, flat panel uh, type. Right, and then you have some variants of TV like smart TV, 3D TVs, and so on and so forth. Right, so what we're going to do is that we're going to look at each of these uh, TV technology quickly, right, and then we'll come to the uh, current more popular and dom dominant technology. Right, okay, so the first TV technology that you have is based on this CRT TV. Right, so the CRT TV, the concept is actually quite easy. What you have is that you have this cathode here. So this cathode is going to send out an uh, electron gun, right? Okay, it's going to be attracted by this particular anode. Cathode is the uh, negative electrode. Anode is the positive electrode. So this particular uh, cathode is going to send out an elect uh, this electron kind of gun. It's going to scan the picture, right, line by line. So it's going to scan this particular picture line by line. Right, okay, so once this this particular electron, it will hit this phosphor coated screen, it will give out light. Right, so essentially this is a, you know, similar to what they have encountered in secondary school, you know, when you do those uh, tube, right, oscilloscope and so on. You try to scan through this particular picture and draw the line, line by line. Okay, so you try to scan through it line by line, and then this, later on, this particular uh, electron will then go through this conductive layer to complete the circuit. Right, okay, so you have three electron, electron guns corresponding to three different color, RGB color. Okay, so the basic idea, therefore, for this CRT TV is a very simple. Right, you just try to adjust this particular uh, voltage at this particular end node here, and then try to let it scan through the display line by line. So this is one uh, top view of a TV. You can see usually for this, CRT TV is very bulky. Any one of you who have tried to help your friend to carry a TV before, you know how heavy it is. Right, typically for a 20-inch TV, it can cost easily 330 uh, kilograms. Right, I have moved one before, so I know how heavy it is. Right, it's no, no joking matters when you try to climb, you know, the NTU staff quarter, there's no lift. One of the, uh, one of the buildings, there's no lift. You have to carry it, it's very heavy. Right, okay, so the advantages and disadvantages of this CRT TV, uh, CRT TV is quite clear. Right, so the advantages is it has good uh, color, fidelity, right, and contrast. And usually the viewing angle for CRT TV is considered as reasonably good. So the disadvantages is also very clear. First, it's very bulky and it's very heavy. And the screen that you have typically, right, before it gets obsolete, is about, like, typically about 28 inch, 32 inch. Those are the maximum screen you are talking about. Clearly, it's much smaller than what the TV screen can support nowadays. Right, this is an obsolete technology, right? So no one is producing CRT TV anymore. Right, so the next type of TV that we are going to show you is the projection TV. So projection TV, there's two types of projection TV. One is the front projection, the other is the back projection. So the front projection TV is something very similar to this projector here. You have a projector, and then you have a separate screen. So that is the uh, front projection TV. The back projection is you known, probably you have seen it before, probably four or five years back, you know, there's those very big TV, right? Okay, it's a little bit, not too flat. The size is probably about one feet, uh, one feet kind of a depth, right? Okay, sh later on I'll show you a picture. You'll see what is that uh, back projection TV. So the idea of this uh, projection TV is pretty much, first you create a very high quality image, right? So for this high quality image, and then afterwards, you either transmit the light through this high quality image to project it to the screen, or you got it reflected, okay? So that's why you have two approach. Either you do the transmission through, which is known as a transmittive front projection TV, or you get it reflected, then it's the reflective back projection TV. So those are the two main ideas. Right? You create a small picture and then you use the light that's reflected through it. The, you use the light that's either transmitted through it or reflected through it to create the uh, picture at a larger size. So essentially there's two types as I mentioned to you before. Real projection and the front projection. Shortly I'll show you each of them. Right? 
So for the, uh, in terms of creating this particular picture, right, one is based on the reflective, namely you have this high quality picture and then your light hit it and then got reflected onto the screen. So if you use the approach, it's known as a reflective uh, type. Right, the next one is a transmittive, where you create a high quality uh, picture and then your light actually pass through to project to the screen. Okay, so those are the two main types of projection TV. So the first one that I've explained to you is the front projection TV. So front projection TV, the arrangement is very similar to, for example, the arrangement in this LT here. Right, you have a particular projector there, and then you need to have a separate screen. Okay, so you have a projector, and then you need to have a separate screen here. So you can see this particular projector is going to project the light through this high quality image, and then it's going to be projected onto a particular screen here. Right, okay, so uh, I think the information given here is just what I've explained to you. So this is the front projection TV. It's very intuitive because the arrangement is very similar to what you have you know, in this LT here. The next one is the rear projection TV. So this rear projection TV, if you see this picture, then you may remember, right, probably four years back, five years back, or probably one of your parents bought it like seven or eight years ago. This kind of very big, okay, rear projection or back projection TV there. So how it works is something like this. So first of all, you create a very high quality image, and then your light actually projected and get reflected from this high quality image, and then project to this front panel or this screen here. Okay, the light get reflected and then projected onto the screen here. Okay. So you can see that for this projection TV, again, there's the advantages as well as the disadvantage, uh, disadvantages. So the advantages of this front projection TV is that it can support very large screen. That's why some people still actually like it, especially if they have their own uh, entertainment room. They can just uh, put a projection TV and then their projection can easily be 100 inch. That, so it's very similar to the arrangement in T in a cinema. Right, so therefore the advantage for this kind of projection TV, especially for the front projection one, is it can support very large screen, easily like 60 inch or 100 inch. Right, however, the disadvantages is that for front projection TV, you can kind of imagine, you need a separate setup. You need to have a projector, you need to set up the screen. So you need kind of additional setup before you can view the TV. Right, whereas for the real projection, real projection nowadays, if you go to the shop, you don't see it anymore because actually it has been, become obsolete. No one is you watching this uh, real projection TV anymore. In particular, the reason is because Usually, for those TV, if you have watched it before, huh, you'll notice that if you try to watch it from an angle, the viewing quality is no good at all. But I'm not sure any one of you have watched it before. Any one of you has a real projection TV at home before? Anyone? At least, I'm, at least there must be some of you who has a real projection TV before. Huh? For those of you, if you have it, you'll know. If you try to watch it from an angle, usually the quality is no good. That's why. The reason is because it has a small viewing angle. And the next thing is that it's glare, right? There's a glaring effect. You somehow the picture doesn't look very sharp at all. Right, okay, and then it's still thicker than the flat panel such as the uh, LCD, plasma, and the LED TV that you have. Right, so those are the clear disadvantage of projection TV. Right, so next we are going to move on to the, the current, uh, more dominant TV now. Most of the current commercial TV nowadays are based on one of these three, right? It's either plasma TV, LCD TV, and LED TV. So we are going to look into each of these TV, and I'm going to play you a short video, right, for each of them to give you a little bit more background and information. Right. So the first flat panel TV you are going to look at is the plasma TV. Actually, even plasma TV is not so dominant anymore, right? Nowadays, if you go to the shops, huh, you see most of them is LED TV. LCD even is not so common, but LED and LCDs are closely related, so their technologies is actually still shared up to a certain extent. Plasma TV is actually getting a little bit kind of outdated already. You don't see that many, but still we'll cover it. Right, so how this Plasma TV works is like this. 
So first of all, you have this particular uh, TV here. Of course, you have this glass panel here, right? And then you have this particular, okay, pretty much for this plasma TV, what you have is that, if you remember, what is a TV? A TV is able to you know, display an arrangement of pixels, right? For example, if it's a full HD TV, that means you have 1920 pixels across and then 1080 pixels down. So a TV essentially for this type of TV is consists of right, multiple pixels, okay? Multiple pixels here. Right, so the arrangement will be like this. Here we are just trying to show a small sections of this TV here. First, you have the glass panel here, right? And then you have this dielectric, right? Dielectric, and this dielectric is like the insulator, right? In this insulator or dielectric, you have this particular electrode, right? You can see there's this particular electrode, right? The yellow uh, line here, electrode here, and then you have this electrode, which is the yellow line there, right? And then in this TV, it will consist of a large numbers of these pixels here. Early on, as I mentioned, for example, if you think about a TV, you have 1920 versus 1080 pixels. So each of the pixels, right, you have multiple pixels here, right, and each of the pixels is further consisted of three sub-pixels, right? These sub-pixels, you have red, green, and blue. And corresponding to each of these sub-pixels, you have a sub-pixel electrode that is kind of a corresponding to it. Okay, so for this plasma TV, how it works is that, right, so when the TV, it receives the signal, it will try to decode. And when it try to decode, it will figure out, all right, for each of the pixel in this particular pixel array, what color should be shown at each pixel, right? Once it know what color should be shown at each pixel, then it can further understand. For example, I know that for this particular corresponding pixel, I want to show a certain color. In order to show a certain color, that means it also understand what color for each of these components I should be showing. Okay, so what it does is that it apply, once it understands what color need to be shown by this pixel, and correspondingly what color need to be shown at each of these sub-pixel, you apply a voltage right to this corresponding cell here. Right inside this cell, there's a mixture of gas known as a xenon, xenon and a neon uh, gas there. We apply the voltage here, Right, what it will do is that inside this cell, there's this uh, neon and xenon gas. You apply the voltage, the electron will be ripped off from this gas. And then this particular the gas now will become plasma. Okay, it will become plasma. Hence the name, plasma TV. So once you stop applying the voltage, the electron will get back to the uh, plasma to become the gas. But in the process of doing so, it will give out ultraviolet light. And this ultraviolet light is going to hit the, um, the phosphor-coated screen and give out a tinge of the color. So this tinge of each of these sub-pixel color, when you view it, when it's very small, actually your eye cannot see. You just combine them and merge together, become one color. Okay? So you repeat the whole process for all the other pixels. Now you understand how it works. Pretty much, you apply the voltage, the gas, Will, uh, the electron for the gas will be ripped off and become plasma. And when you start applying the voltage, the electron will get back to the plasma to become the gas. But in the process of doing so, it will give out ultraviolet light. And this ultraviolet light will hit the phosphor coating and give out the light. Okay? So that happened to one pixel. And then if you imagine it duplicate for all the individual pixels, now you have a picture already. Okay? Right, so that's essentially how it works. Right, um, pretty much all these explanations here are already uh, explained verbally. If you want, you can go back uh, to read through it. Now I'm going to, let me see here. Huh? Actually, I'm planning to play you a video. So this is actually what uh, I mentioned to you before. Right, so the electric current will flow through the gas, right? And then once later on, the gas, the electron get back to the plasma, they give out ultraviolet photons here. And these photons here will hit the phosphor and then it will give out the light, okay? So next, I'm going to play you a video. With this video, actually, they have some pictures and they can explain it and then they will try to reinforce what I've explained before, okay? So just uh, sit, board, sit back and enjoy. Right, okay, let me just adjust the volume a bit.
This program contains experiments which are performed by professionals. These tests are dangerous and may involve the use of hazardous materials. They should not be performed or imitated under any circumstances. The famous plasma module. It's made up of two thin plates of glass stuck to one another. It's here where, thanks to plasma, pictures are created. But to understand how, it's time to do some shattering. It all starts with an incoming video signal. For example, through a cable. The signal is sent to the video card, where it's decoded, and to the electronic circuits controlling the appearance of pictures in the plasma module. The module's two glass plates are covered with transparent electrodes. And in order to transform these electrical impulses into pictures made of colored light, the plasma module needs plasma. The transformation happens between the electrodes in the pixels. They're tiny cavities engraved on the rear glass plate and trapped under the front glass plate. Each pixel constitutes one point on the picture being displayed. Each pixel is divided into three sub-pixels. The bottoms of the sub-pixels are coated with phosphor, a substance that gives off light when excited by ultraviolet rays. When that happens, the first sub-pixel gives off red light, the second gives off green light, and the third, blue light. By combining these three colors, each pixel can produce 549 million different colors. Each sub-pixel is filled with a mixture of gas, xenon and neon. When an electrical impulse of about 300 volts rushes through a sub-pixel on its way to the electrodes, electrons from the gas mixture are violently torn off and suddenly float freely. It's no longer gas, it's now plasma. As soon as the discharge ends, the freed electrons immediately return to their places and the plasma once again becomes gas. As they return to their places, the electrons release their surplus energy in the form of ultraviolet rays. It's these rays that excite the subpixel, which gives off light that combines with the light given off by the two other subpixels, and together, they light up the pixel. Every second, the plasma screen sends more than 2 billion electrical impulses into the subpixels in order to turn the gas there into plasma. The sole purpose being the ultraviolet emissions given off once the plasma returns to its gas state. All that so pictures can appear pixel by pixel on the screen. Okay, so that's actually how the plasma TV works. Right, so the next uh, types of flat panel TV we are going to look at is a liquid crystal display or known as a LCD TV. Right, the LCD TV currently is probably one of the most uh, popular TV. Even LED partly is uh, based on it. So let's see how this uh, LCD TV works. So for this LCD TV, essentially its arrangement is something like this. Actually these two diagrams are more or less the same. I just don't show it both because it's a little bit easier to see. All right, so let me just quickly explain this particular, the structures of this LCD TV. So what you have first of all is that you have this fluorescent backlight here, right? So fluorescent backlight is you have a tips of fluorescent tube, right? Those are, you know, um, during those old times you have those uh, white color tube, right? At home, right, in the ceiling. So you have the fluorescent backlight, Okay, and then afterwards you have the first uh, polarizing filter. Let me just explain the structure first and then I'll explain how it works. So you have the first polarizing filter and then you have the glass panel and then you have the two electrodes here, right? Sandwiched between these two electrodes is that you have the liquid crystal layer, okay? Hence the name LCD TV. So LCD TV is because you have this liquid crystal layer in between here, right? And then you have the another glass panel Right, and then finally you have another polarizing filter. Do take note that for this first polarizing filter and the second polarizing filter, you can see that the directions of the polarization is opposite. One is vertical, the other is horizontal. Okay, shortly I'll try to explain why this is the arrangement. And afterwards you have the cover glass in front of the TV. Right, so this is one way of looking at it. Right, a slightly more detailed arrangement is given here, okay, which actually is exactly the same, but this one is a little bit more detailed. Right, so you can see that 
Right, at the end, back end is that you have this fluorescence backlighting. As I mentioned to you, this fluorescence tube is when you are kids, no? most of your home usually use this white fluorescence light. Okay, so those are the fluorescence uh, tube the, providing the backlight here. Right, and then afterwards, you have the first vertical polarizing filter, which is like this arrangement. Okay, and afterwards, you have the glass plate, right, which is something similar to this. And afterwards, you have these subpixel electrodes here. So these subpixel electrodes here actually just correspond to this, right? So for each subpixel, right, in LCD TV, you have an electrode. So it's a subpixel electrode there, right? And then afterwards, you have the liquid crystal layer, similar to this, right? Okay, and then you have the color filter, right? For each pixel in LCD TV, is further consists of three subpixel, what? So you have red green and uh, red, green and blue. So this is one pixel that consists of three further sub-pixels there. Right, okay, so you have the color filter to, in, to determine what color it is. Right, okay, you have the front glass plate, right, okay, and then you have the second uh, horizontal polarizing filter, right, you can see this filter now, this polarization is horizontal. Right, and then finally you have the front plate here, just the, in front of the TV. Right, so this is the structures of the uh, LCD TV. Right, the explanations here is actually just like what I have explained to you uh, before. So if you want, you can go home and read it out because otherwise it's a repetition of what I've just mentioned. Okay, so in order to understand how this LCD TV works, huh, you look at this. Right, so I try to, in this particular slide here, uh, what we have done is we have only know, highlighted some of the most salient parts, okay, so, uh, so that it's easier for you to understand. Right, so for this LCD TV, how it works is like this, right, so first of all, you know, behind the scene, you have a fluorescence backlight, so it's like the tube of white light that will provide the light, okay, so this light will then travel forward. So this light here from this uh, fluorescence backlight will pass through the first vertical polarizing filter. So we know that the light has two possible polarization. You can always express it as, as two uh, polarization. So after you pass through this vertical filter, vertical polarizing filter, all the lights that come out now has only vertical polarization. It only has vertical polarization. So for one moment, assuming that, okay, this light only has vertical polarization, right? Okay, the next thing is that in between you have the liquid crystal layer. So for this liquid crystal layer, if you do not apply any voltage, if you do not apply any voltage to the subpixel electrode, what happens is that this light right, will just remain having vertical polarization if you do not apply any voltage. It will remain to have, the light will have vertical polarization okay, until it hits the second filter, which has a horizontal polarization. So if it hits the second filter with the horizontal polarization, what is going to happen? If you are, suppose if you are in front here, what will you see? You will not see anything, okay? Because the light with vertical polarization hitting the filter with horizontal polarization, the uh, horizontal polarization filter is not going to let any light to go, get through. So if you are standing in front, what you see is purely black. Okay, so now, how do you control the light? Okay, how do you control the light? So what happened now is that, okay, in this particular case here, you can just imagine this is a structure for each subpixel. This is the structure for each subpixel. So assuming that this particular subpixel, uh, let me just give you a quick overview again. For LCD TV, again, you have a TV. And for this TV, you have a configuration or large number of pixels, correct? Each pixel would further be consisted of three subpixels, right? green and blue, okay? So now, what this is trying to show you is just one of the subpixels, okay? Suppose this particular subpixel is having the red color here, okay? So, early on, as I mentioned to you, when you want to show, uh, for example, a video on TV, right, what you do is that you need to know for each pixel what color you want to show, yeah, at the particular location, correct? If you know what pixel, what color you want to show at the particular pixel, that means you also know what's the sub-pixel color, red, green, and blue, you need to show at the particular location. 
Okay, so what it means also is that, right, for example, now for this particular subpixel, I would know for this location how much red light I want it to go through. Now, the only question now is that, how do I control how much light will go through for this particular subpixel here? So, anyone want to take a guess? How do you do that? How do you do that? How do you control the amount of light that needs to go through this particular co uh, red color subpixel? If you look at this particular slide here, anyone can roughly guess what will happen, which is the part you have to do some, you know, some tingling. You have to apply different voltage to the subpixel electrode here. So what, how it works is like this, right? So for this particular LCD street, uh, TV, so once you have known that for each pixel what color you need to show, or for each sub-pixel what color you need to show, what you need to do is that, right, if you re recall, between these two glass plates here, there's actually a sub-pixel electrode. What you can do is you can apply different amount of voltage across this sub-pixel electrode. The amount of voltage that you apply across this sub-pixel electrode would affect the orientation or alignment of this liquid crystal. Because this liquid crystal layer is very sensitive to electric field. When you apply voltage across this, uh, this liquid crystal layer, the alignment or the orientation of the molecule would rotate. Right? Okay? The alignment of this liquid crystal molecule will rotate. And once the alignment of this liquid crystal rotate, what happens is that when the light comes through, first through this vertical polarization, it's going to be twisted by this liquid crystal molecule. So that's why you can kind of imagine that, suppose if you apply the voltage across it, now the molecule, liquid crystal molecule, will also be slightly rotated. Yep. And then this slightly rotated liquid molecule is going to twist your light coming in. So the light initially coming in is vertical polarization, but this liquid crystal molecule can twist it. Twist it. So it twists it a little bit until now some of the light ha will have a horizontal polarization. So this, that means the polarization of the light will be twisted by this alignment of the liquid crystal molecule. And then if that's the case, once they reach this horizon, or horizontal filter, the light can pass through already. So how much light can pass through will depend on how much voltage is applied and how much voltage is applied will determine how much you know, this uh, twisting or the alignment of the liquid molecule will happen. So now if you can imagine, you duplicate the process to all the sub-pixels for each of the pixels and all the pixels in the screen. That's how it works. You need to have an array of electrode to control the voltage at each of the sub-pixels, to control the color at each of the pixels. So in essence, that's how a liquid uh, this uh, LCD TV works. Right, okay, so this is pretty much what I have explained to you. So let's quickly just uh, go through it because I've already explained. We'll go through the point quickly and then I'll let you watch the video again. Then you'll probably reinforce your understanding. Right, okay, so you can see how LCD TV works is that you have two pieces of polarizing filter or glasses. Right, the polarization is at 90 degrees. One vertical, one horizontal. Right, light is polarized when you pass through the first filter, you have a vertical polarization now. So as light passes through the liquid crystal layer, the crystal molecule will bend the light or twist the light. Okay? So in other words, it will change the light polarization. Right? The alignment of the liquid crystal layer, how much is the molecule is twisted, is controlled by the subpixel electrode that you have. Right? The voltage that you apply here. So the color filter layer consists of numerous subpixels. Earlier, I told you each pixel consists of three subpixels: red, green, and blue. Right, so each subpixel can be controlled independently by the electric voltage. So this different voltage will therefore determine the amount of twisting for each liquid uh, crystal uh, molecule for that correspond to the subpixel, and therefore determine how much color will be shown. Okay. So afterwards, the polarized light will go through the second polarizing filter, which is has which has a horizontal orientation. Right, okay, so I think now 
after you have listened to my explanation, more or less you have some idea already. So let's watch this particular video. You'll try to re you, I think it will further reinforce your understanding. Okay. This program contains experiments which are performed by professionals. These tests are dangerous and may involve the use of hazardous materials. They should not be performed or imitated under any circumstances. Leave the deconstruction to us. We have insurance. The LCD television. It has a liquid crystal screen that displays 60 images each second in 17 million colors. To do that, it sends rays of light through the screen's pixels toward the viewer. The challenge, controlling this light to create these images. To get the job done, the television bends that light with a very special fluid, liquid crystals. Bending light? Okay, but how does that work? The LCD screen television. Fluorescent tubes. The actual screen. Polarizing filter number one. A layer of liquid crystals. Pixels. They make up each point of the image displayed on the screen. And finally, polarizing filter number two. When the television is on, light from the tubes flow through the screen toward the viewer. The pixels color the light like so many tiny pieces of stained glass. Each pixel is made up of three sub-pixels. A red one, a green one, and a blue one. With just these three basic colors, the screen can produce 17 million colors. How? By controlling the quantity of light that flows through each pixel, the television can create 17 million combinations of these three basic colors. And that means 17 million colors. The question is, how does the television control the quantity of light that goes through each subpixel? To answer the question, we'll have to blow the TV up. Fluorescent tubes provide the light that will flow through the screen toward the viewer. First thing to know, light, no matter its source, always has a direction. And because it's an electromagnetic wave, it also has an orientation. A light ray can be vertical, horizontal, or any angle in between. That's important because the first polarizing filter's job is to let only vertical light rays through. These rays flow through the liquid crystal, then each subpixel, until they reach the second polarizing filter, which only lets horizontal rays through. In other words, if the subpixels are constantly flooded by light from the fluorescent tubes, this light cannot reach the viewer. The screen stays black. It's up to those liquid crystals to twist the light so it can make it through the second polarizing filter. The liquid crystals are a very particular fluid. Their molecules behave just like a liquid. They can move and change places at all times. But like in all crystals, their orientation, how they align at a given time, remains the same. And here's another thing. Liquid crystals are sensitive to electric fields, which can change that orientation. As it happens, on each side of the layer of liquid crystals, there's a transparent electrode grid. The electrodes make it possible to control very precisely the orientation of the liquid crystals behind each subpixel. The liquid crystal molecules act like tiny lenses that twist the light. Liquid crystal makes it possible to control the orientation of light and therefore the quantity of light for each subpixel. That light can then flow through the second polarizing filter and reach the viewer. The LCD television. 
Because of two polarizing filters that oppose one another, no ray of light should be able to flow through it. But thanks to those liquid crystals that act like tiny lenses, they can twist that light and control exactly how much light flows through the screen. And that's how it lights up each point on the screen. All right. Okay, so hopefully after you have watched these two videos, at least now you have a high level understanding of how an LCD and plasma TV works. Right, so the next TV we are going to look at is uh, LED TV. LED, LED TV stands for Light Emitting Diode TV. So essentially the current LED TV that you see in the market, uh, if you go to one of the shops like Courts or Harvey Norman, the LED TV that you see nowadays, most of them are going to fall under this particular category. Okay, so how this LED TV works is actually very simple. Essentially, the current commercial LED TV that you have in the shops, huh, essentially what it has is, is exactly the same as your LCD TV that you have watched before, except the backlight here that you have. Instead of previously, for, previously for LCD TV, you see the backlight is the fluorescence tube, right? The white fluorescence tube. But for LED TV, instead of having the white fluorescence, fluorescence tube, what you have is you have the LED backlight here. So the backlight, the light is source is the LED light. So now the next thing you may ask is why do I want to do that? Why do I want to replace the, you know, the fluorescence tube, the backlight with this LED light? Okay, so there's essentially two reasons why you want to do that. The number one is that LED lights are very power efficient, so therefore it consumes less power. Number two is that when you have an arrangement of LED lights, you can you know, change, you can switch certain parts of the LED light on and certain parts off. Right? By doing that, by manipulating that, you'll be able to improve that, you know, the contrast of the picture. So what it means is like this. So imagine that, for example, you look at this particular um, LCD screen here. So this particular current view is that you have some blue skies here and then you have some dark clouds and areas here. So how this uh, LED lighting work can increase the image contrast is like this. Right, you can see the backlight here is actually consists of a large configuration of this LED light. So if you know that this part is, for example, this part of the image is bright, what you can do is that you can, sell, you can choose to switch on this part of the LED, right? You can switch on this part of the LED lights here. If this part of the image is dark, you can choose to switch off this part of the LEDs here. So if you switch part this on and you switch off this part, you can see this part now will be brighter, the backlight will be brighter, this part, the backlight will be darker, right? So by doing that, actually, you can actually increase the contrast between this bright area and the dark area. Therefore, it looks a lot more dynamic. The contrast is higher. The picture quality will be better. Right? So let me just recap. For LED TV that you see currently in the market, essentially, it's just like LCD TV, except the backlight, you replace it okay, with LED light. Okay? So the explanation actually here, yeah, right, can so you can see here, LED TV here can be considered as a modification of the LCD TV. Right, the only difference is you use LED array, okay, a configuration of LED lights here to light up the display, okay, rather than using the fluorescence backlight in LCD TV. So that's the main difference. Right, okay, so in case you miss out some of the, you know, uh, a piece of information here and there about the LCD TV, Actually, this particular video on the LED TV is pretty long. It's a longer video, right? There's a little bit of a uh, sales pitch inside because the video is coming from Sony. So it's up to you whether you want to listen to those sales pitch. But, right, this is a, a slightly longer video. I'll let you watch it, right? And then we'll go through. Probably I'll highlight some of the salient points. There's been a lot of confusion around LCD TV backlighting recently. Today, I'm going to take you inside an LCD TV to explain how some of these new backlighting technologies work. I'm Tim, and this is Learn TV.
OLED TVs haven't been a mainstream technology for very long. So it's no surprise that it's quite confusing trying to keep up with all the technologies in them. Today, I want to try and simplify some of that. All LCDs fundamentally work the same way. They have a backlight behind the screen, and that backlight is shining through a liquid crystal panel. Each individual pixel is represented by a liquid crystal door, if you like. That door can open to a variety of different levels to allow various amounts of light to pass through it. In front of each of those doors, you have a red, a green, or a blue colored filter. On a panel like this one, which is a full HD panel, 1920 dots by 1080 dots, for each one of those 2 million pixels on screen, or each one of those 2 million dots on screen, you have a red, a green, and a blue colored filter, and doors, LCD doors, behind them, uh, which are allowing the light to pass through. By combining all those colors together, you get a complete full color picture. But as you can imagine, in a system like that, there are a variety of elements that are going to determine the picture quality. Obviously, the backlight is one of them. The backlight can affect the brightness of the picture. It can affect the color accuracy of the picture. Imagine if you've got a backlight that is a slight yellow tinge to it. If you then shine it through one of those red colored filters, instead of getting a nice deep red, you're going to get a color that's a bit more orangey. The panel itself determines things like viewing angles. You may have heard of response times as well on LCD TVs. That's a specification that we don't use a lot anymore when describing LCD TVs because it's not as relevant as it used to be. Most LCD TVs that you buy are quite capable of coping with full video motion without causing too much blur on screen now. The other element which is really important in an LCD TV is the picture processing. So if you're looking at two TVs side by side, chances are they will have similar panels, they'll have similar backlights, but the video processing itself, in Sony's case we describe it as Bravia Engine, is actually going to affect the picture quality far more. Today I want to focus on backlights. This is a conventional fluorescent backlit LCD. So these tubes are what's called cold cathode fluorescent lights. You might see them occasionally described as CCFL backlights. This is a good way of backlighting an LCD TV because they're very low cost and they produce a good light output and last for a long period of time. However, there are some limitations of backlighting an LCD TV in this way. The first is color accuracy. The intention with a backlight is to create as white an output from the light as possible. Now, the whiter the output, the broader the range of colors that you're going to be able to produce up. This is because white in light actually contains all of the colors. So if you shine a pure white light for a red colored filter, you're going to get a purer red out of it. CCFL backlights are a little bit limited in terms of their color range because they're not pure white. So only have uh, developed a special coating on the fluorescent tubes which produces a purer white light output. And many Sony TVs offer a wider color gamut as a result of that. The other limitation with CCFL backlights is that they're not as power efficient as they could be. A CCFL backlight is still far more power efficient than other display technologies. But again, Sony has developed a technology called HCFL, or hot cathode fluorescent backlighting, in order to enhance the backlighting power consumption even further. The other type of backlighting, which you're likely to find on more expensive LCD panels, is LED backlighting. Now, LED backlighting shouldn't be confused with LED televisions or OLEDs, which you may have also come across. LED backlit LCD TVs, while some manufacturers do describe them as LED TVs, are in fact the same LCD TVs. The only difference is that instead of using the fluorescent tubes, they're using small light emitting diodes, or LEDs, for the backlighting. There are three main ways that they use LEDs for backlighting LCD TVs. The first is conventional white LED backlighting. Now, this effectively has an array of white LEDs behind the screen, which creates the light source. These are very good as far as low power consumption and relatively cost effective as well, although still a lot more expensive than fluorescent lights for backlighting. The second, developed by Sony back in 2004, is RGB LED backlighting. Now, RGB LED backlighting offers far superior color to any other display technology. RGB stands for red, green, and blue, and this system actually uses red, green, and blue LEDs combined to create a purer white light output than you could produce with a single white LED alone. The third, which is the one that's getting quite a lot of hype at the moment, is what's called edge LED backlighting. Sony introduced the first edge LED backlit TV back in 2008, our ZX series. 
The ZX series has got the advantage of being extremely thin, in fact 9.9 millimetres. So this is the principal benefit of edge LED backlighting. With edge LED backlighting, you have an array of LEDs that run around the edge of the screen, and then a clever light diffusion panel, which makes the light come from the edges and give you an even backlight behind the panel. The important thing to note is that while these TVs are using LEDs for backlighting, they are not LED TVs. Let me show you why. You've probably actually seen real LED displays before. Certainly if you've been to a large sports match or you've uh, been somewhere like Times Square where there are large video billboards, most of those are created using LEDs. The reason why you don't find LED TVs in your home is that LEDs are simply too big. Here's one to give you an idea. Now this is actually a fairly small one, but most of you will have seen LEDs before. They're used in all manner of devices. But in order to be able to compare this to the pixels on a full HD TV, I'm going to need to get the camera a little bit closer. Fortunately, I've got a microscope here that magnifies images by 30 times. So we can use this to have a closer look at the actual pixels on the LCD TV. You can just make out the pixels on the TV now. To put this in perspective though, here's that LED again. So there's simply no way that you would be able to create an LED TV in a conventional 40 inch or 46 or 50 inch screen size that we are used to. Now while these are obviously not LED TVs as such, they do still have a number of benefits over conventional fluorescent tubes. LEDs are far more power efficient, which means that you can produce a brighter image than a fluorescent tube and you can do it by using less power. So they're more economical to run. The other benefit of LEDs is that you can switch them on and off much more quickly. Now this means that you're able to do things like local dimming. Found on Sony's RGB LED backlit TVs, local dimming allows you to turn off just parts of the picture in order to enhance black levels and therefore contrast in the picture. The benefit of this is that unlike a lot of other technologies, you can actually enhance the contrast in a given image. That means that you can produce a nice deep black and a nice bright white on screen at the same time. This sort of thing is not possible with edge LED backlighting. Edge LED backlighting, while you can switch the LEDs off, by doing so, you dim the entire screen. So it's great if you've got a completely black picture on screen or if you want to produce a very bright image. You can also produce extremely high specifications for contrast. However, in practice, it's not going to give you a deep black and a nice bright colour on screen at the same time. Just to clear up any confusion about the difference between what some manufacturers describe as an LED TV, in other words, an LED backlit LCD TV, and OLED. OLED uses self-illuminated pixels. Now this means that you can produce incredible black levels and contrast. The other benefits of OLED are excellent colour gamut, very good response times, and very wide viewing angles. Because they're self-illuminated, you don't need any type of backlight, which means OLED TVs can also be made incredibly thin. The only OLED TV that's currently available is the XEL1. It's a Sony product, an 11-inch TV, but it is 3 millimetres thin. So it's incredibly thin, and the picture quality, from experience, is quite outstanding. The main thing is, don't get these confused with LED TVs. So LED TVs, as I said, is a marketing term that is used by some manufacturers to describe LCD TVs which use LED backlighting. Well, I hope that's enlightened you in some ways to how LCD TVs work. The backlighting is certainly very important in the overall picture quality of an LCD TV. It affects the power consumption, the brightness, and to a certain extent the colour accuracy on screen as well. However, it is not everything to do with picture quality. The picture processing and the panel also play a big part. So the important point is to always use your eyes rather than the spec sheets when you're comparing one TV to another. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Learn TV. Right. Okay. So essentially, what uh, one of the key distinctions that I need to highlight is that nowadays, if you go to the store, if you see this uh, LED TV, what it means is that essentially what you have is a LCD TV but with the LED backlight. Right. Okay. There's another type of uh, LED TV known as OLED. Oh, OLED is a new generation of TV which has not. Uh, which is not so popular yet. 
but in a few years time this is probably going to be the most dominant TV type because the picture is very sharp, quality is very good, it's very thin. Right, so shortly I'll show you a bit more about it. But I think we should still quickly just uh, wrap up on uh, what we have discussed today. So today we introduced three types of flat panel TV, plasma, LCD and LED. So in terms of the price, usually LED is a little bit higher. Plasma is the lowest. Actually nowadays this is getting more. You don't see plasma TV that much often. In terms of power consumption, by now you know LED is the most efficient. Okay? Uh, plasma is the least efficient. Weight-wise, plasma is the heaviest. Viewing angle, actually this viewing angle, color, motion, contrast, huh? all these factors, you have to take it with a pinch of salt now because in TV technology, things move really, really fast. In a few months time, you know, things change very quickly. So a lot of things probably is true like one year ago or two years ago, it's probably no longer true now. So this is just for your own reference. Huh? So in the past, even uh, until a few years back, like two or three years back, plasma is considered to have a best viewing angle Right, best color production, and it can handle fast uh, motion well. It also has good contrast ratio. But in the past, plasma TV has this particular problem known as the burn, uh, this burning effect. What it means is that if you play a particular video that has a dark area, after a while, for example, you change, a, for example, this particular TV screen here. If this corner, you play a dark corner for a while, afterwards you change the color, you see that there's a black patch there. Right, that's called the burning effect. In the older generation of plasma TV, it does have the problem. But with the newer generation of plasma TV, actually this problem has been resolved already. Okay, so in short, right, this one is more for your reference. It's not really cast in stone because things change very quickly for TV technology. Right, okay, that's just actually, since we come to this particular juncture, I just want to quickly wrap up with this particular video. It's a short video, don't worry, it's not a long video. So early on, I've told you, currently in most of the store, when you have the TV, is L, when you see the LED TV, it's actually LCD TV with LED backlight. But there's a new type of TV known as an OLED, organic LED TV. This is the next wave, right? This is the one you should watch out because in one or two years' time, this is the one who is going to become very dominant. So I'll just, right, so it's actually based on uh, organic compound of this emissive layer, right? The exact technology, how it works, you don't have to worry about it, but just keep an eye on this technology. So I'm going to play you a short video. This is a video from the CES, the Consumer Electronics Show. Okay, this here. Right, just to give you a feel, huh? right? Uh, it's about three minutes video. The CES 2014, and never has the same concern, take a look at our new product lineup. Discover that Ultra HD is the big theme at Samsung stand. Sadly, the Korean giant hasn't announced any new OLED TVs for 2014, and Plasma appears to have been quietly sidelined. Instead, it was 4K LED LCD panels that dominated the stand, with Samsung showing off their flat UH8500 and curved UH9000 models. The UH8500 comes in 65 and 75 inch screen sizes, whilst the UH9000 has a choice of 55 and 65 inches. In a closed door demo, we got a closer look at some of Samsung's Ultra HD development. Dominating the room was the 105 inch Ultra HD TV with a curved LED LCD panel with a 5K resolution of 5120 by 2160 pixels. The panel has a 21 to 9 aspect ratio which makes it ideal for movie fans and at least the curve makes more sense at this screen size. Unlike their Korean competitors, Samsung currently have no plans to actually release this TV this year. Samsung also have introduced their new Auto Dock Enhancer on this year's 4K models, which adjusts the contrast at a pixel level to improve the perceived depth of 2D images. They also improved the Ultra HD application of their clear motion frame interpolation software. Samsung's smart TV platform for a facelift now includes a multi-screen feature for greater multitasking. The platform is also four times faster than the last year and includes a new gaming pad. The remote has also had a makeover, allowing for motion control, but it does look rather similar to LG's controller. Of interest to anyone who cares about image accuracy are Samsung's Ultra HD calibration tools. This Windows based software will allow professional calibrators to adjust the voice scale, gamma, and color gamut on your Samsung 4K TV. Of course, there's little point in having an Ultra HD TV if there's no content to watch on it, and in the US at least, Samsung may have the answer. 
They will be providing the UHD video pack with every Ultra HD TV bought. Thanks to a deal of 20th Century Fox and Paramount, the dedicated hard drive will come preloaded with eight movies in native 4K. Samsung will make more movies available for download each quarter, up to a total of 50 over the next year. While Samsung have no plans to release the 4K OLED TV this year, they did have a 55-inch curved concept model on display. This model was bundable, allowing owners to choose how much of a curve they want, or preferably none at all. And for those that want a glimpse of the far future, there was also a 98-inch Quad Ultra HD TV, that's 8K to the rest of us. Although like all TVs that Samsung was showing on their stand this year, it was purely conceptual. Stay tuned for more CES updates on avforums.com. So I've just introduced a perfect present for your boyfriend or girlfriend's parents. Eh? <laughs> right, okay, I'll see you um, tomorrow.